tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's edition, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with two audio adaptations of frightening fiction about scattered states and reinforced regulations. I'm your host, Otis Jiry, and tonight... I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring to life the frightening fiction of James Vaudre and the Vespers Bell are voice talents Nick Goroff, Terry Hudson, and Steve Taylor. Now, get your ticket ready, take your seat in our Theater of the Minds, and brace yourself. It's time to... Turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Our first tale this evening is written by James Vaudre and is performed by Nick Goroff. In it, our protagonist wakes from a nightmare and writes to calm their nerves. They find that something's given them the nightmare to pull them up from sleep and draw them to it. It feeds on them. When they awake again in the morning, suddenly changed, a part of their soul consumed. Now, without further ado, I present to you, Shattered. After the nightmare, I lay in bed, staring at the bars of light cast above the bedroom door, their shape shimmering, their color splitting, as if shining through a prism. The lines wavered and rippled, and I willed my vision to stabilize, grounding myself in the steadiness of those bars cast from the lamp outside. My lingering dread of the nightmare clung to me like the cold sweat between my shoulder blades. My jaw ached, as if I had been screaming the whole time, silently screaming, alone in my terror. My wife snored softly beside me. The gentle, comforting rustle of her breaths helped take me further from my dream, closer to reality. Eventually, the bars of light grew solid and white, their usual color. With the sweat now dry on my back, but my sense of unease still strong, I shifted out of the sheets as silently as I could and crept to the study across the landing. I knew I had to write something, to pour out my thoughts and ride out the chemical storm in my brain that insisted that I was somehow in danger, when the rational part of my mind knew this was not the case. As I write this now, I know the events of my dream were not real. I know that they were bizarre manifestations of my daily worries. I work in a stressful job, and this affects me in ways I never expected. So, occasional nightmares seem like a normal outlet. But this felt different. It had weight to it. A real sense of threat that I hadn't experienced before. It started, as dreams do, in a series of random events. 
a roller coaster ride through collected images and events, some real, some imagined. I can't recall them completely, but I eventually found myself on a beach. The sea was calm, and the fine sands golden in the warm light of the sunset. I was surrounded by friends, some of whom I hadn't seen in years. We talked and reminisced, the years of missed time between us seeming to fade away, leaving only the joy of old friends reunited. My own happiness cooled as I became aware of a sheer cliff face rising behind me at the edge of the beach. A looming grey wall of razor-edged slate and cold, echoing fissures. My friends were up there, climbing the sharp rocks, pulling them loose. A boulder bounced free, smashing close to them, but still they climbed and yelled to each other with excitement. My sense of danger grew. I shouted out for them to be careful. They ignored me and continued to clamber on the jagged cliff. At the top, a massive structure I hadn't noticed before loomed, black against the dusk sky, perched like a watchful vulture. It looked like a pair of old tower blocks, brutal concrete buildings with thick, undecorated walls joined together by an open, narrow staircase that wound up through the middle of them. The sound of laughter faded in my ears, and as I gazed at the structure I realized that the light made no sense. The sun was behind me, setting in the ocean, yet in the negative space between the staircases a deep red light poured out, like blood oozing from a wound. Silhouetted in the blood light, the body of a young woman hanged, her head lolled forward, suspended. At first I thought she was hanging by her neck, but the light glinted on something wired into her jaw, something metal and cold, reaching down from the concrete ceiling above her. Suddenly, her whole body jerked, and I jolted with it. She was alive. A cold breeze crept down from the cliff top, carrying with it a whimpering, keening cry and an odd, grating noise, like boots on wet gravel. The crying sound pierced through my head like tinnitus, then stopped, replaced by rushed whispering, some phrase I could not make out, over and over. My heart pounded, my breath came in jerking gasps, my bones were lead weights locked together as I sank into the sand unable to move. I cried out. Her head snapped upright, and I knew that she saw me. I felt her awful, tortured will turn down towards me like a burning searchlight in the darkness of my consciousness. I was pulled into her torment, trapped with her in an awful, confused agony she had known someone, had trusted them deeply, and they had betrayed her. All of this washed through me, a pain that wasn't mine, but had become a part of me nonetheless. My vision turned red, and the dream peeled back to reveal another layer, some inevitable truth that threatened to burn away whatever was left of my sanity, whatever was left of me. I felt heat rippling over my skin. I was closing in on death, or madness, or hell, whatever it was. I was filled with the certainty that from that point I would never be the same again. Then, abruptly, I awoke, the burning sensation replaced by cold sweat. The dread was still on me. I was smothered by it, my breath shallow and dry. I don't know how long it took for that fear to wash away. When I started writing this, my nerves were still raw, 
and more than once I stopped to check that nothing was creeping behind me, that no dead thing was shambling its way up the stairs to snap my unguarded neck. That feeling faded as the words played out on the note paper. My plan worked. I stood and stretched, feeling significantly better, and decided to get a drink before trying to sleep again. I picked up my empty glass and headed for the stairs. The floorboards creaked with each step as I crept, the sounds distinct and familiar, each plank different to the other. But there was something else. Another layer of texture beneath each wooden groan. Something grating. I stopped and listened, feeling the familiar cold creep of fear trace up my spine. She had followed me. That tormented woman, she was lurking in the darkness, crouching in the shadows like... <sighs> my wife's snoring was as loud as it was soothing. My breath released in a shuddering exhalation. Giddy with relief, I risked waking her as I bounded downstairs to the kitchen. I opened the fridge, using its light to find the juice, and poured myself a tall glass. I drank greedily, relishing the tang of it, then refilled the glass to take upstairs. I replaced the bottle, but as I stood to close the door, something small and white clattered between my feet. With an numb hand, I reached down and found it. A hard, little thing the size of a pea with sharp edges. I held it up to the weak light and realized that it was a tooth. Its pronged roots dug into my fingertip. Sharp and painful, even in my light grip. I pushed the forefinger of my other hand into my mouth and felt around. None of my teeth were missing. I turned away, letting the door swing slowly shut as I dropped the tooth in the sink and picked up the glass. The fridge light shone from behind me for a moment as I walked toward the hall door. In its cold glare, I saw what had been waiting for me. She was pressed flat against the kitchen wall behind the doorway so that my back had been to her on opening the fridge. She was tall. Her awful, long neck rose up high above me on jutting vertebrae that bent around the top of the doorway. A pale, gaunt face peered down from above the frame, its contorted jaw wired with crude, jutting twists of metal beneath dangling black hair that hung like wet vines of a pitch-black, staring eyes. The door closed, and the light went out. I froze, gripping the glass tumbler. The light had blinded me to the dark and I could see nothing but the kitchen doorway's vague shape and the shadows surrounding it. Shadows that hid the twisted shape of the waiting thing. My mind reeled into overdrive to tell me that I was seeing things, that the sprawled thing had been a trick of the light, a distortion of my own shadow. I think this could have worked. I believe I could have convinced myself that I had imagined the whole horrific sight if it wasn't for the sound that came from the darkness above me. <sighs> the same noise I had heard before, but dismissed. In the dead silence of the kitchen, I heard it clearly. A grinding crunching sound, like bone in a millstone, like grinding teeth. I knew then that she had been the source of my dream, like a ferret running 
a rabbit from its warren, she had flushed me out of sleep, separating me from the warmth and protection of my family to corral me down here, alone. Another tooth skittered along the floor. It crunched beneath my feet as I tried to run, but there was no chance. She dropped onto me like a spider, a whirl of cold, gray flesh and shadow, and her long, splayed fingers enveloped my face before I could even scream. My mind reeled at the terror of those reaching dead fingers, closing out the light, pulling me into silent, freezing darkness. The tumbler flew out of my hand, her dead legs and arms wrapped around me. I braced for the pain, but none came. I had the vague sense of claws stabbing into me, rending me, digging deep towards my center. I felt them scrape against something inside, some piece of me that fractured and broke away. I heard the dropped glass shatter, falling into jagged, glittering pieces. And scattered amongst the shards, I knew, lay those broken, dead teeth. I lay in bed, staring at the bars of light above my door, willing them to stop shimmering, to become fixed. The lingering panic washed off me slowly, refusing to fully release its grip. My jaw ached. I must have been clenching it in my sleep. My back felt cold. Beside me, the rough, irritating breaths of my wife made it difficult to concentrate. The light bars settled on a sick yellow color, and I decided that was good enough. I was as grounded as I'd ever be. I felt drained. My muscles ached, refusing to move, but my wife's snoring persisted, and the sharp annoyance I felt at this made returning to sleep impossible. So I gave up and crawled out of bed. The faint glow around my curtains told me that it was time to get up anyway. My bones creaked as I stood and stretched. The fear had gone. Whatever the nightmare had been, it had Past. Yet I felt as if something was wrong. It was that nagging feeling you get when you know you're forgetting something important but can't bring yourself to remember. Only this was worse. Deeper somehow. I went against my routine of going straight to the bathroom. Instead, I decided to sit in the study. The yellow tinge still corrupted my vision, and I wanted to gather my thoughts by writing them out. I am starting to feel better already, although that jaundiced color is still bothering me. It lies over everything, a greasy shade that I can't shake. I had meant to write out my nightmare, but I can't recall it. It's strange. There are pages of writing before this one that I don't remember filling out. I don't have the time to read them. My wife is getting up, but I'm sure this book was empty yesterday. It doesn't really matter. I need to get these thoughts out. There's still something I can't put my finger on. Don't understand what I've lost, but it feels important. I have to remember to come back to this. I mustn't forget. My wife is screaming downstairs. She's shouting up to me, crying for help. She says she hurt herself. I'm unsure why, but I don't want to go to her yet. She's yelling about glass on the floor. She sounds angry and scared. She says something is broken down there. I think she's right. Something is broken.
I hope you enjoyed Shattered, as written by James Vaudray and performed by Nick Goroff. Our second tale of the evening is written by The Vespers Bell and performed by Nick Goroff, featuring Terry Hudson and Steve Taylor. In it, we experience an alternate reality we can all be thankful not to live in. Now, without further ado, I present to you Sleep Mask Mandate. Attention loyal citizen and or marginalized subject. There is presently an exponential rise in reports of sleep paralysis and other parasomnias within the region corresponding to your in-group central territory. As such, municipal health departments have logically been granted inimputable authority for so long as they deem necessary. Your innate in-group bias, municipal bylaws, thereby compel you to comply with public health measures intended to mitigate the severity of this crisis. Do not panic, as this is likely to increase the occurrence of sleep paralysis episodes and is therefore in violation of municipal bylaws. Avoid sleep-disrupting activities as much as possible except in instances when doing so would negatively impact your local or national GDP figures. Refrain from discussing this crisis with others, as both the stress of this event and the power of suggestion are believed to increase the frequency and severity of sleep paralysis. Remember, we are all in this alone, together. Our initial mitigation strategy of a total sleep ban was the subject of much criticism and controversy. While these critiques were initially dismissed as anti-scientific and extremist rhetoric, subsequent peer review has determined that they do hold some merit. Concordantly, a sleep mask mandate is now in effect. Enclosed within this care package is one Eigengrau hypnagogic hypnopomic sleep mask. It is comfortable enough to wear all night and provides 100% blackout and noise cancellation. Please note that this sleep mask only prevents visual and auditory hallucinations during sleep paralysis episodes. Emotional hallucinations may still occur. If at any time you should wake up experiencing a sense of dread, terror, or panic, do not attempt to remove your sleep mask, as your inability to do so will only exacerbate your distress. Refusal to wear this mask to bed or attempting to remove it during a sleep paralysis episode is a violation of municipal bylaws. Noncompliance is its own punishment. For more information, Simply dial the Dreaming Eye icon on your phone's keypad. It has always been there. You simply failed to notice it when it was of no use to you. Let's all keep our arbitrarily defined in-group safe. Stay woke by sleeping sound. What the hell? I muttered to myself as I carefully read over the quixotic letter again. I found it when I checked my mailbox but there was no address on it. If the postal worker had dropped it off, it must have been a mass market thing. I was tempted to peek into my neighbor's mailboxes to see if they had received anything similar, but thought better of it. That was probably the kind of thing you could get evicted for. The letter had a logo of a dream gadget, with an eye in the center, but there was otherwise no identifying information on it. The font was cursive which struck me as a very odd choice until I took a closer look and realized that I was looking at live ink. Someone had gone to the trouble of handwriting this. It couldn't have been a mass market. It briefly crossed my mind that this could have been a bioterrorist attack or something like that, but I highly doubted that I would be anyone's prime target. But I was going to be exposed to anthrax. It would have happened as soon as I opened the letter. So, I didn't see what the point would be in going through the whole charade of a fake public health crisis. Whatever this was, I quickly decided that it had to be either a prank or a guerrilla marketing campaign. Carefully peering into the envelope, 
I cautiously stuck my fingers in and fished out the complimentary sleep mask contained within. The first thing I noticed about it was how incredibly black it was. It was almost Vanta black, which I guess was to help it block out the light. The only part of it that wasn't black was a white logo on the front, the same cyclopic dreamcatcher logo that had been on the letter. It was made from a breathable, satiny material that was cool to the touch, and it was stuffed with a thin layer of foam. The head strap was broad enough to completely cover the ears, and there was additional padding around the eyes that tapered at the temples. I carefully inspected the mask for several minutes, sniffing and gently prodding it for any sign of anything suspicious or malicious, but found nothing. It honestly seemed like a pretty high-quality sleep mask, one that I would have been happy to receive as a free promotional item had it not been for the odd letter that came with it. I didn't see how it could possibly be a prank or an attack, so a stealth marketing campaign was the only thing that made sense. Convinced that neither my safety or dignity were in any real jeopardy, I slipped the mask on to see if it worked as advertised. The first thing I noticed wasn't the darkness, but the silence. Everything went dead silent, and I had to pull the mask on and off my ears multiple times just to confirm the effect was real. I tried speaking with it on, and I was only able to hear my own voice through bone conduction. I put a pair of headphones on top of it, and I still couldn't hear anything. And when I put a pair of earbuds on underneath, it was like the sound of footsteps after a fresh snowfall. Somehow that thin layer of foam was absorbing all the ambient noise. I pinched it to see if I could locate any noise-canceling earbuds embedded inside, but as far as I can tell, it was just foam. It was incredible. The mask's full blackout was nearly mundane in comparison. Or at least it was at first. I left it on for a few minutes, just to see how well it blocked the light after my eyes had adjusted, and that's when things started to get a little... strange. The letter had used the word Eigengrau when describing the mask. Eigengrau is the name for the color you see when you close your eyes. It's German, and it's often translated to intrinsic gray or significant gray. But I believe the most literal translation is one's own gray. I don't know if it was just because that's how the mask branded itself, but for some reason when I wore it, I became very much aware that what I was seeing wasn't just darkness or blackness, but Eichengrau, the color I see when I think I can't see anything. It was like I was staring into an infinite, fathomless void of my own grey. Within this void, my phosphines stood out much more prominently as well. Phosphines are what you see when your retinal cells fire up in the absence of any light. Not everyone notices them, but mine are nebulous shapes that form in the faint electric snow of my eigengrau. When I wore the mask, they were much less nebulous than normal. They were almost three-dimensional, and in the dance of their usual chaotic movement and shape-shifting, I got the uneasy sense that there were in fact some method to their madness. The effect was disquieting enough that I took the mask off and put it aside as I went about my day. When night came, I briefly considered trying the mask back on to see how comfortable it was to sleep in but the memory of gazing into the vast eigengrau abyss of living phosphines was enough to put me off the idea. That turned out to be a mistake, because that night I experienced sleep paralysis for the first time in my life. I woke up and realized that I couldn't move anything besides my eyes, and panic immediately overtook me. I didn't initially think that it was sleep paralysis, just regular old paralysis. The letter from that morning didn't even enter my mind at first. 
I thought instead that I had either been accidentally or maybe even intentionally poisoned. I tried calling for help, but of course, I couldn't speak either. My eyes began darting around the room, desperately looking for any threat that might be lurking in the shadows. On the far right of the room, I spotted the silhouette of a hooded and hunched back figure looming in the doorway, its pure white eyes locked onto me. I wondered how long it had been there. How long had it been watching me sleep? Did it even realize I was awake yet? Or that I could see it? If it did, why wasn't it reacting? I don't think I can properly convey in words the sense of absolute hopeless dread that came over me when I saw a bright white smile spread across its shadowed black face. My every survival instinct demanded that I get up and run or defend myself, but my racing heart and surging adrenaline were all in vain, as my body was still completely immobilized. My tormentor, on the other hand, made no sudden movements, not because he couldn't, but because he didn't need to. Unlike me, he had no dire impetus for action, and he was smugly rubbing my face in it. For the rest of the night, or what felt like it at least, we just stared at each other. I never took my eyes off of him for more than a fraction of a second to make sure there weren't other creatures lurking in the corners of my vision. He just stood there, staring and smiling. Standing so unnaturally still, I did at times question whether or not he was really there. When he finally did move, it was to hold up the sleep mask in his long, tattered fingers. With a wink and a nod, he tossed it over onto my bed before vanishing the instant the dawn's light began to creep through my curtains. When I was eventually able to move again, I immediately reached to my phone to call 911. That's when I noticed the one-eyed Dreamcatcher logo on my keypad, exactly as the letter had said I would. Since I was desperate to know what the hell was going on, I decided to press that instead. Hello, and thank you for calling the Eigengrau Parasomnia hotline. All of our operators are either unemployed, employed elsewhere, or no longer eligible for employment due to death or other preventable health issues. Please stay on the line as we adjust our economic models to account for this labor shortage. What? I stared angrily at my phone. The voice on the pre-recorded message sounded oddly distorted, like he was actually speaking backwards and the playback had been reversed. If you are calling to report non-compliance with the sleep mask mandate, please make a self-righteous, outraged, and or despondent post on social media regarding the issue. If you are calling to report a defect in your Eigengrau sleep mask, please note that emergency funding was only sufficient to provide one free mask per individual, but replacements are available for purchase at your personal expense. If you're calling because you have recently suffered a sleep paralysis episode, please stay on the line, and one of our helpful associates will inevitably be with you. The pre-recorded message ended with a sharp click as the audio switched to the Muzak version of Twinkle Twinkle Little Star on an infinite loop. I was listening to it for at least ten minutes before I was put through to someone. Hello. And thank you for calling the Eigengrau Parasomnia Hotline. My name is Zephyria. How may I be of assistance today? Is this a real person? I asked irritably, since that was the whole reason I had stayed on the line for as long as I had. No. The young woman replied in a cheery, perhaps somewhat taunting tone. But I'm not a robot, if that's what you mean. Are you calling for information regarding the sleep paralysis outbreak? There is no sleep paralysis outbreak. I already looked online and there's nothing going on. Sir, I believe it was Abraham Lincoln who said that you shouldn't believe everything you read on the internet. 
Communications regarding the outbreak are currently being suppressed by your municipal health department as the contagion is believed to be mimetic in nature. Please remain calm and comply with the instructions you received with your sleep mask. I know you're messing with me. I asked around yesterday and no one I spoke to got one of your damn sleep masks. I never had sleep paralysis until last night. How the hell did you do it? Did you put something in the envelope? Sir, I want to help you, but you're becoming irrational. You claim we're lying, but admit that you've recently suffered an unprecedented episode of sleep paralysis. Did you wear the mask we sent you? No, I didn't wear the sleep mask last night. That's why the mandate is in effect, for your protection. There's an outbreak of sleep paralysis and other parasomnias in your area at the moment, and you've been affected by it. We aren't causing it, we're responding to it. How is that possible? How can there be an outbreak of sleep paralysis? Mass psychogenic illnesses are a very real phenomenon, sir. Medieval Europe famously had several outbreaks of dancing plagues, for example. Unfortunately, the immaterial nature of the vector makes it rather difficult to trace. What we do know is that you've been exposed. As I mentioned, this is believed to be a mimetic contagion, which is why no one else is willing to talk to you about it. To avoid spreading it to others, please only speak about it with designated Eigengrau personnel like myself. Wear your sleep mask, and you shouldn't have any more episodes of sleep paralysis. If you guys are legit, then what the hell was with that weird-ass letter you sent out? Or the recorded greeting I heard when I called for that matter? Yes, sir. I realize those may have been less than optimally worded. Due to the suddenness of the crisis, our public outreach campaign was rather rushed. Any irregularities in any of our messages you heard or read are a result of our campaign director's lack of fluency in the English language and our inability to properly vet them before they were sent out. We're doing our best to avoid a repeat of such issues in the future. I... I began before trailing off. I wanted to call her out again, but in my stressed out and sleep deprived state, everything she was saying seemed oddly plausible. Sir, I realize you're tired and scared, which is perfectly understandable. Just comply with the guidelines you've been given, and we'll get through this together. But how does a soundproof sleep mask help with hallucinations? If anything, wouldn't sensory deprivation make them worse? Sleep paralysis hallucinations are a result of your panicking brain looking for threats in the sensory information that it has. The mask makes it so that your brain has nothing to work with. You can't jump at shadows you can't see. I... All right. That makes sense. I'll try the mask on tonight and see if it helps. I relented. Thank you. You're very welcome, sir. You have a good night's sleep tonight. I wore the sleep mask to bed that night, hopeful that it would work as promised and keep me from having another episode of sleep paralysis. I still saw the same enhanced eigengrau and phosphines when I wore it, but there was a simple solution to that. I just closed my eyes. Why my own grey was stronger inside the mask than my own eyelids, I honestly had no idea. As long as the mask worked, I didn't care. I couldn't hear anything, and I couldn't see anything. It was a bit like being in a sensory deprivation pod. If you let your mind race and start spinning patterns out of the nothingness, hallucinations and panic attacks are likely to follow. But... If you embrace the silence, embrace the darkness, and let your mind settle to the ambient sensory vacancy, you can achieve a state of zen-like calm that you can carry with you well after the experience is over. That's what I tried to do, knowing that fixating on my sleep paralysis would only increase the chances of it happening again. I just lay there in the quiet darkness, 
counting my own breaths and ignoring every other thought and sensation until I drifted off to sleep. I awoke with the overpowering sensation that I was not alone, that I was being watched again. I started looking around to find the figure from the previous night, but of course I could see nothing with the sleep mask on. No, that's not true. I didn't see nothing. I saw the Eigenrau void, more vivid and expansive than ever. The phosphine swirled in a maelstrom of pareidolia, my terrifying mind twisting them into forms more menacing than anything I'd seen in the light of day or night. I wanted to take the mask off. I didn't want to gaze into the nightmare abyss before me. I wanted to see what the hell was in my room with me. At first I didn't even try to take the mask off, since I assumed I was paralyzed again. It took me a minute to realize that I wasn't actually paralyzed, but had simply seized up in fear. I could move, if I willed myself enough. Still, I fought the urge. As long as I wore the mask, I knew the visions weren't real. If I took it off, then I'd have no way to tell the nightmare from reality, and the episode would spiral out of control. Even as the sensation of other people in the room grew stronger, I told myself it wasn't real. None of this was real. The thing I saw the night before wasn't real. And that's when an alarming thought popped into my head. One I'm embarrassed to say didn't occur to me sooner. If the figure from the night before hadn't been real, then how had he thrown the sleep mask onto my bed? In a mad panic, I tore the sleep mask off my face. Perched at the foot of my bed was some form of succubus. She had the form of a nude, voluptuous woman composed of an ethereal, dark purple mist that glowed a deep pink at her extremities. Her fingers were clawed. Her digit-grade feet looked like high heels and her long pointed ears stuck through the luscious mane of her hair. She had a tail, wings, and horns, like a traditional demon, along with a pair of radiant reptilian eyes that were staring down right at me. She smiled widely, revealing a set of glistening, predatory teeth and a flickering forked tongue. Ah, still can't sleep? She asked in a mocking, sympathetic tone. Though it was now heavy with a demonic timber, I still recognized the voice as Zephyrus. I was hoping you'd find me a little less unsettling than my brother. Not that he can help it, of course. We were shaped by the thoughts of those who first dreamed of us. As an incubus, he's either threatening or creepy. But I get to be tempting. She rose to her full height, her horns scraping the ceiling since she was standing on the bed, provocatively posing herself so that I could get a full view of her. You're not real! I screamed, trying to convince myself more than her. Yeah, I told you that already. I'm a tulpa, a thought form, an egregore if you want to be a pretentious shit about it. I'm sustained by the thoughts of mortals, which is why I'm going to make sure you never stop thinking about me. I started to bolt out of my bed, but she pounced on me like a cat and pinned me against the mattress. You can't run away from your nightmares, honey. Her face was inches away from my own as she glared at me with an equal mix of lust and hunger. You can only wake up from them. And if they follow you into the waking world, then you're kind of up a creek now, aren't you? Incorrect. The fear. Apologies. Fine. Folk of the dire insomnium offer both effective and affordable dream-catching services for exactly this sort of situation. A distorted yet familiar monotone voice said from behind me. I turned my head back, expecting to see the figure from the night before but instead I saw a tall man in a shabby suit 
the large bulbous head, and a face that was impossible to focus on. He had to have been another thought form, but he was clearly no incubus or kin to Zephria. Has this ever happened to you? he asked dramatically, theatrically gesturing towards me with one hand. It sounded rhetorical, but when he didn't follow up with anything else, I assumed he was actually asking. Yes, yes, it's happening now. Trying to enjoy a good night's rest only to be assaulted by a sexually threatening and or alluring sleep paralysis demon? The fair, fine folks at the dire insomnium can help. Using dream-catching techniques wrongfully appropriated from First Nations tribes, the dire insomnium can weave an incorporeal dream-catcher powered by your own subconscious thoughts, which will provide foolproof protection against such unwanted incursions into your mindscape. In exchange, we require a mere tithe of your unused dream energy to be siphoned off to power the insomnium's machinations and or acts of philanthropic goodwill. I recognize your voice. You're the recording from the hotline. You two are working together. Busted. Don't worry about him, love. He's just a traveling salesman looking to make a buck. You don't want to kick me out of here, do you? We could have so much fun together. I tried pushing her off me, but she was more than impossibly strong. She was immovable. You can really get rid of her? And the other one? I demanded of the strange man by my bed. Indeed. The dire insomnium knows better than most the value of a good night's sleep and is eager to bring the sleep paralysis outbreak to an end. If you agree to my terms, I can deploy the dream catcher immediately. Solomon, you are being a real cockblock right now, so why don't you bugger off and... Yes, yes, I agree. Just get rid of her. Seriously? You consent to having your mind pumped dry for a chastity belt rather than spend a night with a succubus? Unbelievable. She sighed in frustration as she pushed herself off of me. I tried to get out of bed again, but this time it was Solomon who caught me. He held my head still with one hand, while using the other to strap the mask back on. The municipal sleep mask mandate must be observed before I can legally proceed. Please count backwards from the number of sheep that ever have or will exist. And before I could object, I fell asleep. I haven't had an episode of sleep paralysis since, or any more encounters with any troopers. I still wear the sleep mask, though, and I still see the sea of Eigengrau when I do. My false fiends reveal the outlines of strange scenes I can't quite make sense of, so I keep my eyes shut as much as I can. I don't know exactly what Solomon did, but I know he put something inside my mind that's tapping into my subconscious. I can feel it grinding away in there, and I'm not sure what effects it might be having on me. The worst part of all of this is that I know I was hustled. I know that Solomon and Zephria were working together. She only got into my head in the first place so that I would let Solomon do anything to get her out. I don't think he actually gave me any kind of dream catcher. I'm just paying projection now. If Solomon ever wants me to upgrade my subscription, all he has to do is tell Zephria to pay me another visit. That's why I still wear the mask, if you were wondering. I think there was some truth in what Zephria told me and that she and her brother can't manifest strongly enough to do me harm if I can't see or hear them. So, if you ever receive one of these sleep masks in the mail, my advice is for you to wear it every night, and don't take it off, no matter what you think might be lurking by your bedside. And it is a municipal health department mandate, after all.
I hope you enjoyed Sleep Mask Mandate as written by the Vespers Bell and performed by Nick Goroff, featuring Terry Hudson and Steve Taylor, my good friend Steve Taylor. More of the Vespers Bell's work can be found right here on our very own network. On to the show. Longtime resident, Otis Jiry, that'd be me. Well, I got my own show here on our network as well, Scary Stories Told in the Dark, which you can hear every Sunday night. We also have Eric Peabody's Horror Hill, a podcast dedicated to some of our deeper and darker tales. We hope you check them out. And Drew Blood's Dark Tales airs on Fridays, featuring some southern down-home horror. And don't forget to check out The Fear from the Heartland Archives, featuring more than 120 episodes. Well, friends, our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight. And to remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word, and to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host for the evening, filling in for Steve Taylor, Otis Jiry, and as always, it's been a pleasure. Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.